You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to the Useless Information Podcast, my collection of fascinating true stories from the flip side of history. My name is Steve Silverman, and today's story is titled Tunnel Joe Holmes. But before we do that, let's start with today's question of the day. And for today's question of the day, I thought I'd ask you about toothpaste. Now, some of the big brands are Crest, Colgate, Aquafresh, and so on. And some of you may even recall Pepsi and Gleam and some other brands that were big years ago. Now, here's a list of five additional brands. Four of them were once real toothpaste brands, and one of them was not. I made that one up. So which one is fictitious? Here are your choices in alphabetical order. One, Benetol. Two, Lily. Three, Marvident. Four, Pibico. Or five, Sozodont. Again, four of these five toothpaste brands were once marketed. Which one did I make up? Was it one, Benetol, two, Lily, three, Marvident, four, Pibico, or five, Sozodont? And as always, I'll let you think about these choices for a bit, and I'll let you know the answer later in this podcast. And now for today's story titled, Tunnel Joe Holmes. And it takes place on Sunday, February 18th of 1951 at 9.15 in the morning. The location is the Maryland Penitentiary. It, to be more specific, it's prison cell number 119, and it contains inmate number 32565. That's one Joseph Ellsworth Holmes. He's a habitual criminal who had been in and out of either the reformatory or jail since he was nine years old. Now, up until this point, Holmes had been known to the people of Baltimore as the Dinner Time Burglar. That's a nickname he had picked up because he'd been breaking into the mansions of highly paid executives and doctors during, and you guessed it, the dinner hour, and he was robbing them blind. Now, once he was caught for these crimes, the judge just couldn't believe the length of his previous criminal record, and he gave him 20 years in the slammer. Which is why we are here. As I said, we're here at prison cell number 119 at 9.15 in the morning. And that's to get this guy, Holmes, out of bed. And this was the job of cell house officer George Gearhart. But Holmes appeared to be sound asleep. So Gearhart unlocked the cell door and he prodded Holmes, only to find out that the supposed human body under that blanket was really a pillow. Holmes had vanished. But where could he have gone? This was, after all, a fairly modern prison by early 1950 standards, and escape was assumed to be nearly impossible. So Gearhart looked around, and suddenly his foot happened to stumble upon a slightly uneven lip on the slate floor that was under the cot. So he lifted the bed up, and he realized that the 2-inch or 5-centimeter thick slate slab had been fashioned into a kind of trap door, and it was hinged to the wall. When he flipped the massive hunk of metamorphosed clay up, he was shocked to discover a hole carved through the cell's 10-inch or 25-centimeter thick concrete floor. Now, I was unable to locate the diameter of this hole in any document, but judging from the pictures that appeared in the press at the time, I would estimate it to be no more than about 30 inches or three quarters of a meter in diameter. So you had to be a pretty thin guy to get through this hole. Believe it or not, at first prison officials were unsure if Holmes had escaped or not. They knew that it was a long distance to get out of the prison and more than likely he was still inside that tunnel. So they decided to send the gopher in to be sure. And that lucky guy was a prison guard named Arthur Newsom. But Newsom was too big of a guy to fit through that tiny hole that Joe Holmes had chiseled through the concrete floor of that cell. So Newsom took off all of his clothes, but that didn't help. They had to wait until someone came and chiseled the concrete opening wider so that he could fit through. Eventually, Newsom did squeeze into that hole, and things just got worse. He had entered a small chamber that was tall enough to stand up in. 
That's assuming you enjoy standing in several feet of muddy sludge. Yet it became clear that a lot of time and thought had gone into the excavation of this tunnel. You see, old shirts and pants had been mud-packed against the walls to prevent a cave-in. Then, a shoulder-wide tunnel angled downward from this muddy chamber. Now, you're probably wondering why downward if you're trying to escape. Well, that's very simple. Holmes somehow knew that he had to dig under the footing of the prison's 5-foot or 1.5-meter thick outer walls. And down and down he went, and once Newsom bottomed out, there was a sudden 80-degree steep upward climb, and that brought him up from a depth of 26 feet, or about 8 meters, up to the surface. He then poked his head out through a small hole in the grassy surface, and he realized that he had cleared the waterless moat that surrounded the entire penitentiary. All that separated him from the rest of the world was a picket fence. It was now clear that Joe Holmes was gone. And prison officials were in such disbelief that they waited five and a half hours before they let the Baltimore City Police know that the escape had occurred. Can you believe that? And assuming that Joe Holmes had left many hours before the escape was discovered, he was clearly long gone. And you can bet that it didn't take long for the press to pick up on this story. Joe Holmes was no longer referred to as the dinnertime burglar. He was now the groundhog, the human mole, and the one name that stuck with him for the rest of his life. That was a name given to him by the Baltimore Afro-American. He was now Tunnel Joe Holmes. Prison officials had multiple excuses as to how this could have happened. You know, such as the number of guards have been cut in the last budget. Or the prison was built in 1899, so its concrete floor wasn't reinforced with steel, nor was it thick enough. Or how about a leaking storm sewer eroded all the soil away under the cell? And my favorite being a geologist is that a natural fault line ran under the cell and it caused the tunnel to be formed. Right... While elected officials may have publicly decried Tunnel Joe, the press elevated him to hero status. You see, here was a guy that was the eldest of 11 children, and he was given no chance to succeed in the world. Yet he was able to use his ingenuity to engineer an amazing escape. If he had just been given a proper education, you know, and pointed in the right direction when he was younger, his life could have turned out much differently. Hero or not, Tunnel Joe Holmes was still an escapee from prison. The police followed up on all reported sightings, but they all turned out to be false. They checked with his parents, his sister, former girlfriend, friends, and any other lead they could think of, but the trail went cold. Then, two weeks later on March 3rd, there's a report of a robbery. A 64-year-old woman named Mary Ruiz had been walking home from work at 7.50 p.m. when a man in a brown coat and a tan hat pulled a gun on her and stole her pocketbook containing $5. She immediately ran to a nearby store and she contacted police. Then, just a few minutes later, police officer Frank Plunkett spotted a man that fit the description of the suspect, so he jumped out of his patrol car and he grabbed him by the arm. The suspect pressed a 32 caliber revolver into his stomach and he fired twice, but nothing happened. The gun had misfired both times. Talk about luck. The suspect took off and Plunkett gave chase. He was eventually joined by two other officers. Multiple gunshots were exchanged with the suspect before he tired and he gave himself up. The suspect admitted that he was Joe Holmes. Needless to say, Tunnel Joe was now in a big heap of trouble. He was charged with escaping from prison, possession of a deadly weapon, armed robbery, and of course trying to kill a policeman. He initially pled guilty to all charges except the last one, but by the time of his trial, Holmes' lawyers had him change his plea to being guilty of only the escape from the penitentiary. 
Now, I know you're going to be shocked by this, but it took the jury only 15 minutes to reach a decision. So you're sitting down. Tunnel Joe Holmes was found guilty on all charges. You aren't you shocked? Anyway, the judge sentenced him to five years each for the escape and for the robbery to be served concurrently. And that was to be followed by an additional 15 years for the assault on Officer Plunkett. But he still had 10 years left for the dinnertime burglaries, so he was really being sentenced to 30 years in the slammer, allowing him to be released in 1981. Between the time of his arrest, his questioning by the grand jury, and the trial, many details of the escape emerged. Here's a general overview of how it happened, although the dates and the amount of time that it took varied with different retellings of the story. Tunnel Joe claimed that when a new warden was hired and clamped down on prisoner privileges, he became so outraged that he knew he had to escape. He said that all he had was a couple of drill bits and a thick stick with a nail in one end that he used to drill small holes into the slate. One by one, he drilled hole after hole for 40 days until he completed a large enough oval to form a door. The hinges were added shortly after that. But it was later learned that he paid someone $7 to steal a drill for him, so this part of the story appears to be greatly exaggerated. Once through the slate floor, he used a piece of iron and a hammer to chisel through the concrete subfloor. Now clearly this pounding makes a tremendous amount of noise, so he wrapped the steel in a cloth to muffle the sound and he only did this between 5.30 and 8 or 9 p.m. You see, that was the hours when the prison's radio was being played for entertainment. Mark another five months on the calendar to accomplish this feat. Now that he was through the floor, it was just a matter of removing a lot of dirt. So that his prison clothes would not get soiled, he worked in his underwear, and he carried the dirt up in a handmade cloth bag, and he flushed it down the toilet. For illumination, he fashioned a kerosene lamp from a small bottle with a wick punched through its cap. Finally, 11 months after he started, Tunnel Joe made a small opening through at the surface. It was just big enough so he could see where he was. The next morning, he made his escape emerging from the hole at 1.15 a.m. He simply pulled his clean clothes out of a bag that he had dragged along, got dressed, and he hopped over the fence to freedom. It's unclear where he went after his escape. Holmes claimed to have gone to Philadelphia, and since he was unable to find work there, he came back to Baltimore. But some suggest he never left the city in the first place while others say he came back to enjoy the sudden fame that he'd achieved, while others suggest he didn't know how to live on the outside without the rules and the structure of prison. I guess what happened during those two weeks will probably never be known. Back in prison, Tunnel Joe became a bit of a hero and initially did not give up his bid for freedom. A July 3, 1953 search of his cell turned up a number of weapons, and he was suspected of being the mastermind behind a mass exodus of prisoners planned for the next day. On October 3rd of that same year, prison officials said that Tunnel Joe was at it once again. They found a 10-foot or 3-meter rope that he had fashioned from strips of bed sheets. But Tunnel Joe was going nowhere, and he eventually grew into a harmless old man. Now the victim of a stroke, Holmes dragged his right foot as he walked, and he held his right hand in a claw. He was paroled on October 27th of 1970, and he went to live with his sister. His health continued to deteriorate until he passed away at the University of Maryland Hospital on April 17th of 1973. He was 61 years old. Useless, useful, I'll leave that for you to decide. And now for a few words from our retro sponsor. With the first week of 1938 gone, dare I ask you how you're coming with your New Year's resolutions? (laughs) Well, don't we all? But there's one resolution you really should keep, if only from the selfish motive that it's bound to repay you in dividends of joy and happiness. 
So just resolve right now that come what may for the balance of the new year, you're going to brush your teeth twice each day with Pepsodent toothpaste containing irium. Or if you prefer powder, with Pepsodent tooth powder, also containing remarkable irium. You'll be thrilled and delighted when you see how speedily Pepsodent containing irium makes your smile far brighter, your teeth more naturally bright and sparkling than you perhaps ever thought they could be. And really, it's no trick, no secret. It's simply that Pepsodent alone contains that marvelous new cleansing agent known as irium. And with the help of irium, Pepsodent can easily and quickly brush away dingy surface stains, those same surface stains that actually hide the true beauty of your smile. With these masking surface stains gone, your teeth then glisten and gleam with all their glorious natural radiance. That, you see, is the miracle of irium. Why not learn it for yourself? That commercial for Pepsi and appeared as part of the Mickey Mouse Theater of the Air. That's from the January 9th, 1938 broadcast of Snow White, which appeared on the NBC network. There's very little known about the origins of Pepsodent. Uh, many sources claim that it was clearly on the market by the 1920s, and one book I read said it was introduced in 1915, yet I was able to locate an old newspaper advertisement that showed it for sale on October 14th of 1914. But it was radio that made the product a smash hit. By the 1940s and 50s, Pepsodent was one of the biggest brands of toothpaste in the world. Amazingly, it's almost non-existent today. Most experts have blamed this on the people behind Pepsi and being slow to adopt fluoride into their formulation, so the world just simply moved on without it. The commercial mentions that their secret ingredient is called irium. In reality, that was simply a catchy name made up by the marketing team for sodium lauryl sulfate. That's the same stuff you find in other toothpaste, shampoos, mouth rinses, and yes, cleaning products. And yes, concentration does make a difference here. It sounds scary, but it's been added to products as a foaming and cleansing agent. And as long as you don't consume large amounts of it, and the last time I checked, people don't drink their shampoo or eat entire tubes of toothpaste, it's considered harmless. And if you do swallow too much... Let's just say it acts as a laxative and you'll, you know, you'll be spending a little additional time in the bathroom. Which leads me to the answer to today's question of the day. And I'd ask you which of the following was never a real brand of toothpaste. Your choices were 1. Benetol, 2. Lily, 3. Marvodent, 4. Pibico, or 5. Sozodont. And I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. Um, the one that I made up was Marvodent. I came across all of these while I was searching through the archives for the oldest newspaper that I could find that had an advertisement for Pepsodent. This particular ad was run by the Graham Drugstore of Oak Park, Illinois on September 25th of 1915. If you're curious, the prices were as follows. Benetol, Lily, Pepsodent, and Sozodon were all 19 cents each. Pibico must have had gold in its formulation because it sold for 39 cents. That would be nearly $9 today. What amazes me is that Pepsodent was 19 cents in 1915, and nearly 100 years later, Walgreens is selling a tube for 99 cents. The last thing I want to mention about this is that the ad clearly states that these were toothpaste in tubes, not tooth powders, as some of the modern articles have suggested. And now for a few totally useless, yet totally true tidbits from history. It's time for what I like to call News of the Weird Past. And today's stories all have the same theme in common. They're all about having one's wish fulfilled. Take, for example, the story of 65-year-old Wing Yuk Der. He was a Chinese man who operated a restaurant at 1607 East 55th Street in Chicago. His wish came true on Tuesday, June 2nd of 1959. He got to see his 64-year-old wife for the first time in, get this, 36 years. He had tried all that time to do so, but wars, quotas, and other obstacles just made it impossible for her to leave communist China. Finally, she fled to Hong Kong, and then, with the help of the Immigrant Service League, she was able to secure a visa to the United States. 
She did bring two great-grandchildren with her, a boy and a girl. Apparently, the parents and the grandparents were both deceased, so the couple did plan to adopt these two children. And our second story appeared in the news on June 14th of 1962 in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Back in 1944, American Navy Lieutenant Nathaniel M. Dial was aboard a sinking Japanese prison ship, and he knew that he was dying. So he handed his cherished Annapolis-class ring to a friend with the instructions to, quote, give this to my son. It looked like that was not to be. After the friend ended up in a hospital in Japan, the ring was stolen. Amazingly, 18 years later, the ring was dug up by a workman at the site of a former Japanese prisoner of war camp in Incheon, Korea. Another Korean, who had a limited knowledge of English, was able to make out the inscription on the ring. You know, basically Lieutenant Dial's name and his 1932 year of graduation. But this really was no big deal because the guy that found it decided to pawn the ring. In the meantime, the man who had read the inscription just happened to have mentioned it to the Korean driver for Rear Admiral George H. Pressey. He was the U.S. Naval Commander in Korea at the time. The driver then told Pressey, who just happened to have been a classmate with Lieutenant Dial at the Naval Academy. Pressey zoomed off to that pawn shop to retrieve that ring. And when Lieutenant Dial's son Nathaniel found out about this, he said he knew all about his dad's wish all along, and that was through old Navy friends, but he never, ever expected to see the ring. What were the odds? And our last tidbit for today is dated September 9th of 1973, which reported that August S. Claus, a pastor at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Fresno, California, became a medical doctor after 45 years of part-time study. So why did it take him so long? It's very simple, lack of money. You see, when World War I ended, Runaway inflation made the dream of attending medical school impossible in his native Germany at the time. Instead, he chose to accept a scholarship to a German seminary. But he kept reading medical journals and studying in his spare time. He then emigrated to the United States, accepting a position as a pastor in a small Nebraska congregation. When the Great Depression hit, the church cut off his salary and he was forced to get a part-time job to survive. He finally ended up in California, and he resumed his medical studies part-time at the University of Southern California, you know, USC. He completed his medical degree with a three-month residency at the College of Medical Science in England. And as I mentioned, that's 45 years after he started studying medicine. That's incredible dedication. I hope you enjoyed today's story on Tunnel Joe Holmes and the other little stories that went with that. And I also hope that your new year is off to a great start. If you'd like to read more true stories just like these, please be sure to get a copy of one of my books. They are Einstein's Refrigerator and Lindbergh's Artificial Heart, both written by me, Steve Silverman, and they're available from your local bookseller online and from your local library. You can find additional materials at www.facebook.com slash useless information podcast. That's all one word, useless information podcast. You can also go to my webpage. That's uselessinformation.org. That's uselessinformation.org. I've actually worked on it and updated and fixed the links on that page. First time in a long time. Had a couple of days to work on that. You can also email me at useless at steve.silverman.name if you have any questions or comments. That's useless at steve.silverman.name. There are some links on the web page and the Facebook page also if you'd like to contact me. Anyway, Happy New Year to everybody, and thanks for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Bye.